Hi, welcome to Literaturely, a podcast about teaching literature. I'm Margaret Moth. And I'm Paige Wallace. And today we're talking about building your syllabus. Pretty open-ended, so we have a lot to cover. I think there's some topics we might save for future episodes where we can go in deeper, but we have a lot to say. (laughs) Yeah, and so we want to think about this as like a general overview for building your syllabus. Maybe like the top questions you might have when you first start to build a a syllabi for or or series of syllabi for a literature class. And then some of the things we touch on, like Margaret said, we will come back to and expand on and talk about in, in later episodes. Yeah, and I think this might be considered more introductory material, but I know that some of the things, um, Paige, you've been telling me recently have really challenged the way I think about syllabus building. So I think it is something that once you learn, build your first syllabus or your first 10 syllabi, it doesn't mean you're finished learning about how to build a syllabus. Yeah, and so thinking about you're not finished, if you've been doing it the same way over and over again, and you need to mix it up some, then this episode might also be for you. So not just an intro, but maybe just a way of thinking like, oh, I didn't think about doing that or doing it that way. And as always, like if you have any of your own tips, suggestions, questions you'd like to share, please let us know. I think we'll probably end up saying this every time, but we don't have all the answers and we don't think we do. We love learning from others and we hope we all we know that you all have resources that can be of use. I was just about to say resources because like Margaret said (laughs) I really like resources I love resources so send me your resources so that then I can be like you know I'll tell like 50 other people about this resource like the Sanderson sisters but with pedagogical resources (laughs) like send (laughs) send me all resources it keeps me young (laughs) yes exactly (laughs) okay Cool. So I guess we'll start with choosing a focus, Margaret. Yeah. So obviously, I think your first step is what are you teaching? What are you focusing on? Um, Comp classes, I would say at this point, most universities provide you with your focus to an extent. Maybe not, but it doesn't matter because we're not talking about composition. But what I'm trying to say is that you might, when you're teaching your first literature course, you might be thinking, well, I don't even know where to start. I've never done this before. And so you're first going to have to figure out, like, is this a survey course or special topics? Because that's going to determine kind of the range you need to focus on, what your limitations are, what you're responsible for. Doing a survey course, like, you know, general American literature since 1865, you can't just pick your top five favorite dead white male authors. That's not a survey. It would be good if you were doing a special topics on American masculinity in the 20th (laughs) century. So thinking about this sort of approach. Yeah. And so thinking about what does your department require of you? Sometimes it's really obvious that the class is a survey course, right? So something like American Lit post 1800 might be a survey course, but it's less obvious how to approach a class like Introduction to Literature, which can be treated as a survey course or a special topics course. And so it's really about in that situation, choosing which you want it to be and figuring that out or or which, you know, if there's a departmental requirement which one it has to be and figuring out how you'd flesh those two things out differently. Yeah, and I think something really key is also figuring out what your students are going to be expecting when they sign up for that class. So when they sign up for an intro to literature, what are they expecting to learn and how can you help them achieve that goal? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. And so also thinking about like, I'm not going to teach, you know, the same author six different times in an introduction to literature course, because that's not necessarily what anyone would think they're getting into with that kind of class. It could still be special topics, but not, you know, so specialized that it doesn't meet the sort of standards or implied standards of that class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's something there, like, just like with a PhD that we're expected to be experts in our very niche field, there is something to think about that, okay, if you were to take the survey course and leave with this class, what information would you be expected to know if you never took another British 
literature course post-1945 again or special topics like never take another Shakespeare class or a Toni Morrison class or whatever because this might be the only time your students get this course. What is the essential information? What would, what should you prioritize? And I think that kind of leads into this next point of balancing your research needs versus your students needs. I think a lot of early scholars you're juggling a lot, whether it's your dissertation, your first book of trying to churn out this material, get your work done while also balancing your teaching load. And I think there's a temptation a lot of times to just shoehorn your research interests into the class to make it your, your work easier. And I think there are a lot of benefits to that in terms of like your enthusiasm, your expertise and your engagement but your students don't need to know your dissertation necessarily to succeed in the course. They might need more representation than your dissertation offers, or they might need more text from a different time period or a different geographical location, or they might need text that would be easier for the sorts of assignments you're gonna have them accomplish. Yeah, and so thinking about uh, Margaret, achieving that balance, right? Making a class, I don't want to say work for you, but also work for you, right? As you're mm -hmm. writing your dissertation, there's nothing wrong with incorporating the things that you're passionate about and that you're researching already, but you don't want to pigeonhole it into just a class that's basically a reiteration of your research. Yeah, I know I'm talking a lot. No, I you're fine. Thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking about my women in lit courses where I just wanted to make them my dissertation topic of like, but none of my students were signing up for women in lit being like, Yes, let's only read modernist texts <laughs> that nobody has heard of. I think you were in the room once, Paige, where I asked um, a an audience for a colloquium if they had read the novel I was working on, Played by the Nightingale, and one person raised their hand, and it was my advisor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was. But, yeah, I was there. <laughs> yeah, so that wouldn't be fair, but. The kind of benefit was those, so those classes, I would have maybe one or two texts that I was working with for my dissertation, but I ended up using some of those texts that I taught that I wasn't anticipating including, um, because as I was teaching it, as my students were talking and doing the assignments, I started seeing more connections. And so had I made the class an exact reflection of like my chapter breakdowns, I would have actually missed out on a lot. I would have pigeonholed my own, my own work. Yeah, that's a really good point. Absolutely. Okay, so when you're thinking, you've chosen a focus, um, and then you move into the step of figuring out your course objectives. This is something that until really recently, I have sort of said, mm, kind of like a fill-in-the-blank attitude towards it, right? Oh, course objectives, like I know what I want my students to learn, um, I'll, but I'm kind of copying and pasting from one literature syllabus to the next, right? And so that's something that I am trying to be better at in terms of beginning with course objectives versus beginning with the text because I get really excited about text and I'm like, oh, I want to teach all these things together. And so it can be really alluring to choose your text first and then make your course objectives work for those texts. But what I've been learning lately uh, has been the opposite of that, right? So figuring out what your course objectives are and then making your text work for those particular course objectives. So I'm going to put you on the spot because this has been really interesting to me to hear about this process you're on. So are there any objectives that you now have like decided should be bigger priorities or that you want to add as you've been reflecting on this? I want them to just be more clear. I've been thinking a lot about, okay, so if my objectives are kind of cookie cutter, like evaluate a text, it's obviously not something like as simple as learn to work in a group activity, but they'll have, there'll be some sort of like course objective about collaboration, right? Yeah. And so I want that to be even more specific. If I'm thinking about uh, composing or transferring information or analysis in a digital space, what exactly is my point for that? How am I thinking about design and genre and just like literacy in general, right? So developing your own set of literacy for the tools that you're using in a particular class. And I think that's a course objective that I want to think more about because I tend to have some digital component. And mm -hmm. I think that it is important. Obviously, I don't want it to take over my literature class, but I do want them to use different tools 
and write in different ways and share their ideas in different ways and yeah. become competent in figuring those things out, right? So like a Wix page, which is really an example that is something that I morphed from a composition class to a literature class. So how do you present your ideas using a Wix page and understand that you have to figure out how this this technology works, right? Like I can give you some sort of outlines of how to use it, but generally there is something um, important to you developing your own set of literacy skills for that particular technology. And so, yeah, so those are... Those are a couple things I'm thinking about, but with the course objectives, I just want to be more specific. And so let them evolve so that they don't feel as cookie cutter to me. And when I say something like, I want them to be able to evaluate text, I want them to be able to share their their ideas about those texts in various um, different genres or mediums or whatever. Well, what exactly am I talking about? What will they learn from that? What will they gain from that? Yeah, so it sounds like you're actually setting goals for your class that your students understand rather than like, I don't, I've been thinking lately about how course objectives sometimes just feel like the terms and conditions we use to like cover our bases with the department of like, no, 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 no I promise like I'm teaching stuff. It's not just like fun time with Margaret in the classroom, which it, it feels a little bit like sometimes the course objectives feel like the academic version of legalese. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like whatever buzzword that like we know we think the department wants us to be doing rather than really thinking about, well, what do I want my students to walk away from this course with? Yeah, and I think that sometimes those course objectives feel like they're more like you like you said, they're more for me, for you or for the department um and the students just sort of you introduce them on the first day, but then you don't really come back to them per se. And so I'm thinking about um, in the future pairing course objectives. So like with each assignment. So after uh, like on the assignment sheet for f- having a section that says these are the course objectives that we'll be working on here. And I think that that'll keep me sort of accountable for coming back to them and being really specific with how they're working in my class and not just having them there. Not that I, That's cool. and not that I think that I'm like not doing my course objectives. No. Yeah, but I do think that I haven't given them as much attention as they they deserve or need. Yeah, something that I started doing with my women in like class, and it only it, since you were talking about doing course objectives for um, an assignment with each. It's not an assignment, but since um, one of my goals for women in light was to really think about the depiction of identity. Um, first day I would have my students fill out a survey where they, you know, defined these identities and I took the words they used to make a word cloud, but I didn't tell them that I did this. And then at the end of the semester, they, uh, the last week they answered the same question and I created a new word cloud with the words they used and we looked at the before and after so they could like see this, um, you know, not concrete, but as concrete as you can get in a lit class, like yeah. depiction of this is how your understanding of this identity has changed from beginning to end. And it's always really cool because a lot of the words stay the same, but they like change sizes or they're like slightly different terms. And we talk about like, well, why are you all choosing this word now versus the beginning? So you also get some rhetoric in there and some discussion about like what prompted these changes, which is really fun and kind of a way you know, to engage those course objectives from beginning to end. Yeah, that's a really interesting and sounds like productive assignment or activity. You should put it into a document for us (laughs) and put it on our resources page because I definitely would use that. I like that a lot. And so, Margaret, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, transferability? Yeah, I would. So one of my goals... For any class I teach, Compro Lit is really grounded in this idea of transfer transferability. That what are my students doing in the classroom that when they leave, they're still going to be using and applying, even if they're not continuing on to grad school. I tell my students like most of you are never going to write a research paper again after you graduate. I know this. You know this. It, it is what it is. So why do I have them do a research paper and really talking them through each step? So things like when my students write a proposal for their research paper, we also look at samples of like grant proposals, business proposals, uh, story pitches, things like that. So they see like, oh, writing this academic proposal has transferability. And 
that's, I guess, an example for how I want to think about my course objectives, that when they're doing these assignments to fulfill these objectives, like what are they really going to be working towards? So thinking about like, we talked about like the analysis of text. That's such like a standard objective for literature courses. And it's a standard for a reason. I'm not against it. But thinking about like, why does that matter for the majority of our students? And I think it is important that what are what is everyone doing during the pandemic? They're binge watching Community or Game of Thrones or they're watching Marvel movies. And that's influencing the way they're thinking about the world. Um, we know that representation matters. And so I want my students to be able to think about what they're consuming and what effect it's having on them. I want them to be able to evaluate ideas and respond to them respectfully and not just resort to straw man arguments or name calling, um, but really break down, hey, this is why I disagree with you and this is how I think we can strengthen these ideas. Um, so when I think about analysis and evaluation, those are the long-term things I'm thinking about. And I want my students, like ideally our students would love the subject enough that they go to grad school for, that they want to keep learning about it. Um, so I want to prepare them for further scholarship, but I also want them to be able to engage with these sorts of text materials in other contexts as well. I think that's a really great explanation of transferability. And I don't know that I can add anything without being redundant. <laughs> but yeah, like I, and I think your example of the pandemic is, is spot on, that these analytical and evaluation skills are valuable to you outside of the classroom. And I think that maybe the only thing I would add is, again, like not to, uh, to be repetitive, I guess, is to say that some of it is also just like that's like those really tangible skills. I know how to make a podcast after taking this class. I know how to format my paper with MLA standards. I know how to do some really basic Googling to figure out how to answer my own questions about a particular kind of technology. And so those things are kind of like the boring, less glamorous side of teaching um, and teaching literature. But I still think that they're important. I think there's something there of like, I know we don't want to just be like factories for jobs, you know, that there's a lot of critical thinking that academia can provide those sorts of skills. But I do think it might be helpful when thinking about your course objectives to think about that idea of transferability. How would this transfer to a resume? How does this help our students accomplish their goals for when they leave the classroom? So thinking about like students love when they put on their first resume to get that internship, like I'm a team player. But so think about like that, those course objectives. How does your class help them actually be a team player? Um, I talked to my students about that. Like when they do peer editing, that's being a team player. That's learning how to provide feedback to colleagues and, and you know, constructive feedback. Yeah. It's not just, yeah, this is great. Or for resume skills, like thinking about the Wix sites, like that's digital rhetoric. That's a digital portfolio they can take and submit when they want to like intern at a magazine. <laughs> and so thinking about those course objectives, yes, we need to make, the objectives are, is to make them better thinkers, but it's also to help them develop that skill set that's going to help them thrive when they graduate. Okay, so this is my favorite part. Mm -hmm. Choosing text. Um, yeah. And so I told you guys already that I am guilty of figuring out my text first and then, you know, say these are the, the five or six texts that I want to teach this semester that I definitely want to talk about and then mapping them into a class. And that's not best practice. I mean, it, I don't, I won't say it hasn't worked out for me, um, <laughs> but I, I do think that it's not something that I'm going to continue in terms of that being my method for the madness, but I want to talk about choosing a secondary text first. So because I think that I, and it, this relates to learning or course objectives, learning outcomes, because I chose Sarah Ahmed's Living a Feminist Life as a secondary mm -hmm. text to kind of develop my women in lit class. And I did this with a friend, so I, who I'll shout out. This was with Sarah Afsall, who is really passionate about feminist scholarship and feminist uh, text. And so 
we work together and put our class texts together using uh, Sarah Ahmed's uh, Living a Feminist Life as the, the and framing. Can, and can I interrupt you just like for people who haven't read that? How is that book structured? Like what does it mean by feminist life? Yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a, definitely an academic book, but it, she her goals are to write it for a more um, general audience. And so to kind of think about like not – I don't know if the word's like de-elevating, but right, you do know how, um, when... Like approachable? Yeah, accessible, approachable. And so she's talking about what it means to be a feminist killjoy, right? To be the the person who's bringing up the problems, whether those problems are in in your family life, your personal life, at work, or um, in, in academia, right? Which is not immune to these problems. And so what happens when you bring the problem up and then you become the problem instead of the, the structures or the people in charge that are supposed to be addressing the problem instead sort of attack you as the problem, as that killjoy figure. And so she's subverting that image and thinking about what it means to be that killjoy and taking that on as like a, a kind of empowerment. The text works through this identity, the feminist identity, and historicizes it and talks about um, like the sort of queer history of that identity and then ends with her feminist, yeah, her feminist killjoy toolbox, which is a kind of manifesto. What we did is we organized our class around those chapters and chose our text using those chapters thinking about, well, which of these chapters are thinking about, or which text could we use to think about white feminism, second wave, and sort of third wave feminism together. Yeah, so we use our, we use that to choose what text we wanted to use. Um, and then we also use that, that secondary text to help us develop our assignments, that feminist uh, killjoy toolbox. So all of our assignments were part of a larger, like, your toolbox for our students. Yeah, so you had that, like, framework that helped anchor the course that like it sounds like that secondary text provided the scaffolding it did for your students to understand those course objectives yeah it did it really did and so I that's the one and only time that I have chosen a secondary text first and then chose my novels after or my texts after and it was really successful I think um, I think my students got a lot out of it and it was very rewarding for me teaching it something I think I learned recently that I've been mulling over in t- for choosing texts in the future, secondary texts particularly, is literature reviews. I think sometimes we're so focused on choosing secondary texts that are can- canonical that like a chapter from Gender Trouble. <laughs> um, yeah. And students, undergrads, I don't want to say they can't rise to that occasion. They can, but it's going to take them time, which means it's going to take you, you have to allot that necessary time or pick a more accessible text. And so thinking about literature reviews, I think I have found was not only nice for giving students that entryway into that sort of theoretical work, but it also gave them the landscape of multiple perspectives. So it wasn't just like, Judith Butler, Henry Louis Gates, they're the final word on this topic. And it also showed how scholars disagree with each other. You know, like in literature reviews, they're like, this person claims this, but yes. we're over it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that So seeing like, oh, just because it's, you know, published or well received doesn't mean like I have to agree with this, this um, criticism. Um, so that I think can be really helpful too, that choosing that secondary text we need to like open ourselves to more options and not just recycling the same text we were taught in grad school. Yeah, I like this idea of using the reviews. And then I wonder, like, is that something this is, is that something that you would do like a flash essay with? Like write a flash mm-hmm. essay review of this? Oh, maybe. I think that could be interesting. I actually did it for presentations Okay. that... Um, when students, I have students present on theory, so that way we can talk about it as a class um, and work through these ideas together, um, but also that they can engage it without me telling them how to think. Yeah, <laughs> um, so sure. in the past, yeah, that's what I've done is that they present, um, depending on the course, they either are presenting like individually or as a group, and they 
are responsible for like making connections with like the theory to our primary text or they they sometimes will talk about like the cultural context of this theory like why did it what was the exigence for this or how do we take it on now so the one that keeps coming to mind is a thing on disability studies in literature that one student did for my intro to english studies class actually and i'm trying to remember because I want to make sure I get the name right but it was a literature review so I was looking at the kind of whole field and the student did a really great job with it talking about the fact of like where literature or where disability studies sort of started and how it's evolved that we might look back at the beginning of disability studies and kind of be like ooh, I don't want to use that terminology Mm -hmm. or like, that's not how I think about this. So it was Catherine J. Cudlick's Disability History, Why We Need Another Other. And it really called off out the fact that, you know, we still see disabled characters as like the ones who are monsters or the ones who lack or, and that sort of disability is a metaphor for brokenness or otherization. Um, And the student did a really great job with it. But I think it is because they, they couldn't, Gauge with multiple perspectives and see, so it wasn't tokenizing one theory yeah. and just like reducing um, a large field to one person's position. And so, I guess like another question I have then is uh, with secondary text, what's the layout for that, right? So for me, with that secondary text for the women in lit class with Sarah Ahmed's text, we read a chapter. And then had a novel that, or a collection of poetry that went with that chapter. And then interspersed some other shorter secondary texts like essays and such. What do you think your ratio is? Or what do you, like, what's your goal ratio for secondary texts versus those sort of primary? Um, typically I have had, like... I was going to say about one secondary text per primary text. Um, I will say the short story class tends to be the exception because it's short stories. Yeah. Um, So, but generally when I'm working with novels, I think it is one secondary text per novel. We might begin the class with a couple of secondary texts. Uh, My Women in Lit class, the last few times I taught it, I was beginning with um, Sadia Hartman's Tale of Two Venuses Mm -hmm. because I wanted them to think about representation and the ethics of representation um, in both research and narrative. But in terms of like the structure of it, it kind of depends on the novel. So I'm thinking like sometimes I would have them read the secondary text beforehand so they would have an understanding of the sorts of ideas we were going to be grappling with throughout the work. But other times I would end it because I didn't want I don't know how to it was twofold on one hand I wanted them to be more aware of the biases they bring when they read so like for example we would read Herland by Charlotte Perkins Gilman and when the students first read it they're like this is such a feminist text this is so empowering she's really showing that women can do anything and then we would read um a secondary text and the name is escaping me um i'm going to try to remember it but it calls out charlotte perkins gilman's feminism is white feminism (laughs) um it doesn't care about people of color it doesn't care about disabled people it doesn't care about queer people and so they read this text and they go back over her land thinking about they're like yeah all the women in her land are white able-bodied heterosexual (laughs) like they're described as Aryan and it kind of really emphasizes for them the blindness that these sorts of identity readings can sometimes yield like if you're just reading through your own lens your own perspective you're going to come away with that perspective affirmed and for me if I if they read that secondary theory before the novel they wouldn't see their own blindness Mm -hmm. in these sorts of readings it would just be charlotte perkins gilman as the villain rather than how are we complicit it with as readers with this as scholars as composers that makes a lot of sense yeah i agree with like the one one ratio and except for in the short story classes it's just two (laughs) it's it's a unachievable goal i think yeah I tend to have, like, I think for short stories, like, one 
secondary text per week. Yeah. I was thinking that. Like, one per week or per unit, however you divide it up. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... We wanted to talk about choosing texts that excite us versus texts you enjoy and how we see those two things as different. You can be excited about talking about a text or unpacking a text that you don't necessarily enjoy or like or stand behind. Do we want to talk about that? Yeah. I, I Sorry, I tell my students this whenever we do the term paper. Or they're, but they're like, well, I don't know would write about these are the texts that I enjoyed this semester. Oh, no, 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 no. You're missing out. One of the most fun parts of analysis is tearing apart the things that bother you. Yes. <laughs> um, what bothers you? What confuses you? What's, like, keeping you up at night? That's the thing that you want to talk about. And if I just pick the things that I enjoyed, what am I going to do? Stand in front of them and say, guys, wasn't this great? And when they say, no, what's my next step? (laughs) They're like, no, we hated this text that you love. (laughs) I don't need my feelings hurt. I have the internet for that. I mean, but, you know, inevitably you do teach a text that you love and your feelings Mm -hmm. are uh, me. I shouldn't put this on you, but inevitably I do teach a text I love and my feelings are hurt when they're like, we don't understand (laughs) this or we don't like it. But I think yes. And so I also really enjoy that moment of, interrogating complicity like you were talking about with her land with something more contemporary like the help right and so or the blind side both of these one's a a film the other is a book slash film adapt adaptation and they're widely popular students just like hail them at the beginning you know they're like oh this this text is so good and it teaches us so much about equality and race and and i'm like yeah but doesn't what I'm like, but what about this? Does it bother you? Have you you right? And and so understanding some of the the sort of underlying things there. And so those texts, I might be excited to talk about them with students, but not necessarily praise them or enjoy them or think that they're good. And I think the excitement we can also extend back to the course objectives that those click moments. Yeah, uh, click moments in I the like classroom that. that are really exciting. Where you know maybe like there's there's novels or short stories where are they the ones that we love to just read for fun at night maybe not but maybe those are the the texts that we see the click moments happen with our students in terms of like being able to close read or pull out like um connections to a theory and be like oh so this is what judith butler is talking about um i don't know why i keep going to judith butler and i don't know why the text that i want to say this is what she's talking about is the joint bachelor episode of um vanderpump rules uh-huh. where all the guys dress up in drag for the bachelor party and, you're like, and they Judith say butler. If, yeah because they're like if we're gonna dress up like girls we want to be the hottest girls there <laughs> it's like it yep that's the performativity <laughs> if you're gonna do a performance you want to do it well let's break it down yes <laughs> but um yeah like what sort of texts will get students excited about the course objectives and figuring that out. And we want to keep that excitement through the whole semester, right? Mm -hmm. And so one way that you and I both do that is by introducing comics at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. For me, it's we're all tired by the time we get to the end of the semester. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be completely transparent about that. And I enjoy comics, so I'm doing it. They excite me, and I enjoy them. And so giving those to students at the end of the semester can be really productive because it's a text that they don't realize they have to work at and they associate it with something that's fun and easy and completely accessible and then we really get to unpack them and have those moments those click moments where they're like whoa I didn't know I could get this from a comic and so it's 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 really good yeah which starts moving them beyond the classroom of like this sort of analysis we do you know, you can apply to Game of Thrones and go on Reddit and give support your theory with that close reading of Daenerys or like break down like the editing of Vanderpump Rules for other fans and <laughs> give us a rhetorical analysis. Yeah. Um, if that's how you choose to spend your free time, which is exactly how we spend ours. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what else are we going to do? Yeah. So, Margaret, <laughs> what's been your most 
so far, what's been your most successful or your most exciting comic to teach at the end of the semester? Oh, um, surprisingly, Bitch Planet. Okay. Which is a, for those unfamiliar, it is a kind of sci-fi dystopian feminist comic, which sounds like a bunch of just every word people are using right now put together. Yes. (laughs) But... It takes place in the future of the world where women who do not conform to established gender roles are legally charged. And if they're found guilty, which they always are, they're sent to this space station prison, which is colloquially known as Bitch Planet. So if you're too fat, too thin, too assertive, too sexual, not sexy enough, you can go to Bitch Planet. And the basis of the comic is that they're going to start a like kind of sports team with the prisoners to play against the male sports teams to drive up advertising and interest. Um, and there's a lot of other things going on. Um, and it's really useful for talking about depictions of women um, and the words we use to categorize women in narratives. Um, and... The students really enjoy thinking about, like, women's bodies in narrative um, and, and thinking about them. Because the visual component allows us to spend more time talking about this. Like, when is a woman's body, like, the butt of a joke? Or when is it in, used to be empowering but in a, in a humorous moment? Like, where is that line? Can we talk about what, what defines that line? And... It's really fun. I have also the one I was really thought they were going to enjoy was Ms. Marvel, the new the new iteration. They did not. Yes. Oh. They were. N- this happened to me. I also. think it's too close to home that they're like ready to escape high school and yeah. to be put back in it because that's they use words like it's just as immature. They wanted to like it, but I think it was just like to looking into the mirror for them in a way like they're seeing all the things they hate about themselves still. (laughs) Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because I taught that in my introduction to literature class a few semesters ago and same deal. They just, they didn't love it. I think they wanted to. I think they wanted to be excited about it, but they were not. It flopped for me too. And I could tell they really wanted to like it. And I think that goes back to like, Pick the text that excite you, not that you enjoy. I picked one that I thought they'd enjoy. Yeah, and not fair. Like I thought the comics alone would excite them, and that did, and it got them to engage because they, you could tell they were like, we don't want to lose this opportunity mm-hmm. to do comics and get out of a novel like, in the future. Bitch Planet goes over really well every time. Yeah, um, yeah, I did. Um, World of Wakanda, the Roxanne Gay mm-hmm. version, and it went really well. And Women in Lit, the same Women in Lit where we did. Sarah Ahmed's living a feminist life. Yeah. But I haven't done Bitch Planet, so I should. It's definitely one I think you have to do in a women in lit or like a gender studies or queer studies course. Mm-hmm. Um, so that way they build the skill set to talk about depictions of gender. I don't think I would throw it in like an intro to English studies course. And so that does go, I guess, back to the course objectives. Um, Bitch Planet, I think, is... A complicated text. I know that comics kind of still have this bias and stigma, but Bitch Planet's doing a lot of big things, and for them to fully appreciate it, they have to have worked with those secondary texts, yeah. that those other primary texts to make these connections. Yeah, I'd be interested, like, to kind of think through. I, I did a World of Wakanda standalone one for my short story class okay. because I was so annoyed that all the short story comic excerpts in the textbook were were not actually short stories. They were chapters oh, from graphic novels. Oh, gosh. Let's not even talk about that short story book. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yes, I hate the excerpts from that short story book across the board, but I especially hate the, yeah, its selection for quote, quote, comics. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I think, one of the nice things with like comics and choosing text is what we're doing right now of like talking to your friends about it or your colleagues, whatever, because to see hear like what works, what doesn't. Because I don't think you and I ever really talked about comics when we were like actively choosing them for courses. So we didn't get to hear from each other like, oh, Ms. Marvel flops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know if we did that the same semester. I don't, probably not, but we definitely should have talked about that because it flopped hard for me. Remembering your colleagues and friends are resources that you're not the first one to ever teach this course in the history of literature classes. And even if you are, there's similar courses that have been taught. So use that to your advantage. Again, strike the balance between, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to do it my own way, maybe, but um, I'm going to reach out and sort of bounce ideas back and forth because it can be so helpful. Also, just to wrap up before we do our dream class question, mm -hmm. we will do um, like, l think about the logistics of, of your course. Use one of those, the syllabus date creators and we'll put a link on the resources for that if you don't already have it but again you might already have it but don't like do those by hand which i'm so guilty of doing <laughs> when i first started and then also taking a look at the registrar's calendar and thinking about like i don't want to plan my major project to be due the same week of homecoming or the week after spring break or any of those like major things don't make life harder for yourself yeah, absolutely. Also, look at your schedule, too. If you have conferences or if you're traveling, take that into consideration if you can. Because there's nothing worse than, at least for me, there's nothing worse than getting, oh, like, 32 papers and then immediately having to go to a conference and have that hanging over my head the entire time I'm there. And knowing that that adds on an extra week to my grading. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, then let's, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to do our dream course quickly, but what, Margaret, what's your dream course today? So thinking about that, um, I, my dream course, I think, would be workplace narratives okay. today. Thinking about, like, how our conceptualization of work and workplaces has changed, not just, like, post-industrial revolution, but like post-technological -tech revolution as well. Um, so how do we imagine employees, bosses, etc.? I don't, the one that's coming to mind is the a short story, Doris Lessing's To Room 19, mm -hmm. um, sort of the absence of the workplace and how that might affect someone. But I'm also reading right now Dune and thinking about it as like workplace drama. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> so I don't think I would teach that in a class because that is an 800 page novel and undergrads would get that and look at it and be like, I'm dropping this class. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And so my dream class yeah. today is I'm thinking about gardens, victory gardens, uh, obviously the garden of Eden. So I think I might, again, I'm guilty as charged of thinking of text to first, but I'm thinking about uh, uh, gardens and texts that deal with gardens. So maybe a little bit of also like Milton and, um, some stuff that's not always in my wheelhouse, you know, and obviously Genesis, the Bible, the Garden of Eden. And then to, there's this book that I can't remember the actual title or author. So that's really helpful, but <laughs> it's, and it, I think it, I'm pretty sure it's YA, but it's, um, a retelling of the story through Eve's perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'd be interested in, I'm sure that there are a multitude of stories and poems available that are thinking about mm -hmm. it from Eve's perspective that I would want to bring in as well. Well, even now you have me thinking it's not for Garden of Eden, but in the Wrinkle of Time series, which I know you're working with, the Many Waters. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where there's, I feel like they talk a lot about, like, how to cultivate desert, survive in the desert. There's a lot of, like, I don't know. I have to reread that. That was, like, my sexy way back in middle school. Yeah, and so I'm thinking about also gardens that are supposed to be paradise but aren't, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What happens when they're not paradise? That's good for students, I think, to think about utopia, dystopia. We talk about that like one person's utopia is another person's dystopia. So how do we grapple with this? Yeah, um, and I think and so like yeah, I think something like Herland could be relevant to this yeah. as well. Yeah, and I think that's something to kind of bring this full circle. Secondary text and primary text help balance that. That like to understand paradise utopia just why they go wrong dystopia thinking about like queer studies disability studies race studies etc that help us delve into like the normative many quotations around normative idea of paradise is not why it wouldn't actually be paradise now you got me excited i want to that's my dream class too <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so that's all we have for you guys today. See you later. Talk to you later, Margaret. Bye.